It's our great pleasure to welcome to our 2022-23 Online Trend Summit, not one or two, but five guest speakers for this roundtable on gut health. We welcome Alana McFarlane Kempner and Lisa McFarlane, co-founders and CEOs of The Gut Stuff, and they're going to be our panel chairs today. We also welcome Karen Poole, Head of Health at Tesco, Jen Thompson, Head of Regulatory and Compliance at The Hup Group, and Sophie Medlin, Consultant Dietitian and founder of City Dietitians. What a group of people. We're going to be discussing how gut health is perhaps one of the biggest waves that hasn't yet landed, why that is and how that could be changing. Thank you all for joining us today. It's fantastic to welcome you all to our virtual stage. A note to participants, if you're joining today's summit as a Trend Hub subscriber, you can discover more about the topics covered in this discussion and much, much more in the 23 24 food, drink, cuisines, and ingredients trends framework on Trend Hub. And without further ado, we're going to hand over to Alana and Lisa to chair this exciting discussion. Over to you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if you told Alana and I seven years ago that we'd be chairing a panel on gut health, we would have, um, yeah. <laughs> asked you what you'd been drinking probably and um, but we came into gut health very randomly and we were actually djs and we did everything from one extra version radio we were the uh we did the olympics we were the official love island djs not contestants um but very much immersed in pop culture and couldn't have been further from health and wellness coming from a um working class scotch background and also living quite a hedonistic lifestyle as djs and um, but we volunteered for twin research which is a research um department at king's college under tim Spector. Long story short, we were really fascinated about what was different between us as identical twins because we had really different health pathways growing up and we were really curious as to why that was considering we had 100% the same DNA. Tim asked us if we wanted to have our guts analysed as part of new research they were doing into epigenetics, nutrition and the microbiome. And we were like, sure, Tim, what do we have to do? And they said, you have to send off a lot of poo in the post, <laughs> have a couple of colonoscopies um, and... Uh, only drink alcohol and processed foods for a month and then have a really high fiber diet for a month and we we're like great um so two months ensued uh, and it turns out we were part of um you know quite a big study in looking at that and they realized that even though we have 100 percent the same dna we only had 30 percent the same gut bacteria at any point in the study which meant we were basically strangers so this got us on a, a, a incredible journey into gut health because we weren't just speaking to gastroenterologists we were speaking to you know immunologists the head of parkinson's research and realizing that gut health wasn't only you know grossly misunderstood but also super important to overall health and lastly the products and information certainly weren't reaching a younger audience that were thinking about preventative medicine and healthcare. So we set up the gutstuff.com. It's kind of snowballed from here. And we're really excited today um, to bring together um, Jen, Sophie and Karen, because what we've realized is that not only is the category very disparate, the audience is very disparate and the, med the messaging is really, really quite unclear. So hopefully we'll be able to unpack a lot of that today. Yeah, I think as well, you know, we started on this journey seven years ago and all our friends and family and everyone around us was like, what are you talking about? And it's nice that seven years on, more people have a bit of an understanding and I've sort of heard it from other places and not just us two preaching at um, nights out and dinner parties and at gigs. But I think, you know, there is still a, a real disconnect between, um, you know, industry and consumers. And I, I hope today, and I'm sure it will, because, you know, we've got an amazing panel together, we'll start to shed some light on that. What What is gut and what, and what is... Um, in gut health. I think it's such an interesting area, isn't it? And as you say, both of you have said, when I got into looking after, so I've, I'm a consultant colorectal dietitian, when I got into looking after gut health, which was like a long time ago, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I never thought I would be on Instagram talking about poo because I never thought people would be interested. And it's so great that people are. But as you say, it's a complicated category because sometimes we're talking about gut health as in bowel conditions. And of course, something like 20% of the population in the UK live with irritable bowel syndrome. So when we are talking about gut health and gut conditions, sometimes we are talking to 20% of the population. So that's kind of confusing for people. And sometimes we're just talking to people who um, have heard maybe through you guys and other places that actually they need to be looking after their gut. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And what should I be doing? And how can I? And 
so it is a complicated category in that sense. And it's so worth, the, I mean, the more we learn about our gut health, the more we understand why it's so important that we invest in it and look after it. Your gut is a really long organ. Your colon on its own is a meter and a half long. It's massive. And it houses this incredible ecosystem of bacteria that we need to take care of. And when we struggle to take care of it for various different reasons, we can develop things like irritable bowel syndrome. We can develop things like inflammatory bowel disease, even mental health problems and all sorts of other things are linked to our gut health. We've seen certainly that gut health as a category within retail has been on a lot of people's and businesses strategy plans. Have you found that at Tesco, Karen? There's a real tension between um, making it simple and helping customers make choices with the information we share them share with them. So really it is about balancing what we understand about what really drives health and how we help customers make choices on the, on, on the back of that. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think part of our mission at The Gut Stuff is, is to make, you know, the information accessible and products accessible and affordable. And I think people are still trying to get to their five a day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is, is bringing in the microbiome just as a word, just comp over complicating things. But I think for us, and we, we are definitely layman's in that sense, it, the given the gut health knowledge gave us that why piece of why do we need to have 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 five a day but this is really hard to get across because there's so many regs when it comes to gut health and you can't really make claims like that Jen have you found that in your experience from a from a regs point of view gut health is complex it is hard to simplify but not only that the regulation don't make it easy for us there are two main blockers the first one being that there are no claims that we can make that proves that a specific ing ingredient is efficacious for gut health. So we can't claim any efficacy, any effect. And secondly, um, for one particular class of ingredient, probiotics, we can't even use the term itself. So there are a lot of restrictions. So we need to make it simple, but we're really restricted. However, what's really interesting um, to read, consumers are eager to see it. And what they were saying in the report is that they want more simple information. Interestingly, they would even be willing to pay more for packs that are more simple. They don't want to see the technical wording. And one also really interesting part from a health claim point of view is that even though there are no allowed claims and uh, official effect we can claim, the wheat fiber, wheat bran fiber, is really well understood. And it's coming up as one of the, the top recognized claims on product versus something like calcium, which a lot of companies have to add to have that digestive benefit. So it's, it's just really interesting to not only focus on the claims aspect, but really think about consumers' awareness as well, because that will impact how they're going to see your, your product in general. So Sophie, I'd love to know your thoughts on this because you see it really on both sides of the, the coin, don't you, in commerce, but you also have people coming to clinic on a daily basis with conditions that affect their gut. What, what do you think about the sort of complication around the messaging around gut health? Yeah, great question. I think that what we have to remember actually that the general public are pretty comfortable with messaging around heart health, but the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, for example, is complicated, like the development of heart health complications. It's complicated. The understanding about different fractions of fats and good fats and bad fats, that's complicated. But the consumer do understand heart healthy and those basic messages. And I think that we can really harness that as people who invest in the gut health community to support people to make healthier choices. And as you say, Alana, it's about the why. It's about why people are doing it. And one of the real benefits of investing in your gut health is that your body is giving you constant feedback every day, hopefully, about what you put in the top end, right? Because we're all experiencing what comes out the bottom end as a result of what we put in the top end. And we have gas and we have other things that are going on in our bodies all the time. So your body's giving you this constant feedback about how it feels about what you've been consuming. And when we can help people to understand that, then they can actually understand the benefits they are getting from the food that they're eating in a really tangible way that is not tangible if you think about heart health you know no one can see their arteries developing plaques or the problems that they might be having despite them making these changes on the shelves or making choices on the in the supermarkets about what they eat for their heart health for example so I think actually within the gut health space with the right messaging and with the right education just a small piece of education what can I expect from eating this people can get can can physically see those benefits every day 
all the changes and how the body responds to it. So I think we have a real opportunity to harness that in a way that no other sector really does. Because the irony is, is that gut health is actually related to immunity, energy and weight loss. So yeah. all four and, gut health and everything else. <laughs> yeah. And I think that if we perhaps look at gut health as a lens to look at other things or a weight route into things rather than a category, it could be helpful. And I think other countries do that. Um, Asia, for example, is so intrinsic in their culture about bacteria and the microbiome that actually it's the it's a bigger lens to talk about other things. And um, Charles, is there any you know what does the picture look like internationally? It certainly looks from the outside, like the U.S. market, as an example, is much more advanced uh, in terms of a the um, the size of the, the the category as a whole, but also the level of comfort around discussing some of these topics. I'm not a regulatory expert, but my understanding is that they don't have the same regulatory constraints that we perhaps uh, do in uh, the UK um, and also Europe. So, as far as I'm aware, we're still working with the um the eu uh, regulatory guidelines from that perspective and if we look at other parts of the world you know places like uh asia as an example they're just much more comfortable gut gut health and the consumption of the i guess types of products that are naturally associated with gut, good gut health are intrinsic as part of their culture the us is, is a great example where the claims are not restricted so a lot of consumers associate probiotic with gut health very clearly and completely agree with what Sophie said. What, what we have with gut health is we have a direct effect that's practical, whereas if you take a vitamin, a vitamin C for immunity, are you going to feel more immunized? No, you're not. So with, with gut health products, um, if, you, if we didn't have those regulatory barriers, I think it would be really much easier to translate the message in, in the EU and UK, but obviously in the, globally they don't have as much problem. Karen, from your point of view, you know, on the retail side, is it on the agenda of retailers to do that education piece or is it merely just to create categories and, and sell products? Well, I, I think we definitely have a responsibility to help customers make healthier choices when they're doing their shopping. And I think what we've what we really understand with health is just helping nudge customers into making healthier choices and changing the behavior to make those choices different ongoing is really, really difficult. And actually how much information that we share as a broad society, as a broad industry, as a retailer that actually sinks through and makes an impact on your choices when, when you're at the shelf is much is is it's a really small amount and I think it's about being very choiceful about how we kind of help and nudge in, in, in that moment. As well, I think with, with gut health it's it's a strange concept for us all because it is a long-term lifestyle change, a long-term strategy which is great for retailers and you know and the category in general but actually getting people on board and getting them passionate about it enough to change and I think that does come down to, to the education. That behavioural shift is the actual real challenge here. It's not about new products and a new category. It's about how do we start to make people see the category or see gut health as important without sensationalising it or going to extreme. And the truth is the nudges that we need consumers to make are really just to include a little bit more fibre in their diet every day. And that's not necessarily as difficult as it sounds. And I also think that the food industry could do a great job of nudging things. If we think about something like breakfast cereal and how so many of them went multi-grain and they don't taste significantly different but actually they are you're getting multi-different grains which feed different bacteria so people are getting a potential really great benefit there from something that actually hasn't changed significantly in the recipe and maybe some crisps could do that and maybe some popular other popular snack products that are still super cheap and we know adults and children are eating on a daily basis maybe there's some reformulation around fiber that could be done which would make a massive difference to individuals if we really just focused on fiber fiber and said the most important thing which is what I say to everyone all the time the most important thing you can do every day for your gut health is focus on fiber make sure you're eating enough eat your fruits and vegetables plants in all different forms and and I think that it, you know I can see some good schemes in supermarkets where people could kind of have just a bit of better bit of a better understanding about fiber and the benefits of it and, and what is a higher fiber choice or a better choice in terms of fiber versus what they might be choosing instinctively or, or habitually I think that's exactly why when we were picking our first product everyone says to me why did you not do a probiotic bar and I'm like consumers aren't there yet and that's also not the message that we want to portray we want to portray that it's what our granny 
told us that it's good for our gut. Our granddad Jimmy said, like, oh yeah, that makes me go. And actually, if we're not getting fiber, how are we expecting consumers to understand things further down the line, like sauerkraut, how there may or may not be studies um, that say that's beneficial, or kombucha, people have to get past the taste barrier of kombucha to then understand it's not an imag magic elixir of life. So it was like, that's how we said, you know, let's just take this back to the ground level. And it's probably worth caveating that with people that were interested in the gut health category tend to be people with digestive issues, like we've talked about, but fiber isn't necessarily the right thing for people for potentially that have IBS, is it, Sophie? So it can, yeah. again, that's like another layer of complexity. Yeah, for sure. And that's complicated, isn't it? And what I see often going on in the gut health market is people chucking a load of prebiotic fiber into things because some of it tastes sweet, so it's useful to add and things like that. And, you know, we get it. But then that can cause people who have IBS or have general digestive discomfort that's not been diagnosed as anything to get really bloated and uncomfortable and then take a massive step back because they think, oh, no, that that made me feel really unwell. So that education piece is tricky and it is about trying to focus it on the general population as opposed to individuals who already have a gut health problem, as it were. And I, I'm not sure there's an easy way of telling some people, no, no, you shouldn't have this, but you should have this. I don't think that's easy to do. But I think, you know, the more people understand about things, the better. Yeah, I think that and that's one thing that we're finding at the gut stuff as as more research comes out, which is amazing with the links to, you know, not only digestive issues, but things like menopause, you know, amazing research around, around mental health, immunity. People are coming into gut health from so many different angles and they all, you know, essentially we can't sell to everyone's wants and needs. And Jen, what do you think the answer is? This is a very loaded question. <laughs> to get that mass market appeal, like what, what is going to appeal to everyone that's coming into the category from all different places? To be honest, I really agree with what everyone has said. I think the answer is to start simple, start in small steps and, and re-simplify the category. Um, and I was looking at, again, how do, do consumers react to claims? And there's a, a report from Euromonitor, a recent one, which has a really interesting, some really interesting information. So apparently 25% of consumers, that's globally, look for contained fiber claim on food and drink labels. And then 62% report that they are looking for fiber for their digestive health. So they get it. But having said that, um, in the UK, even though the whole grain claim position has increased globally and is now number one and has surpassed no sugar. Mm -hmm. In the UK, that's not the case. The no sugar claim is still number one on food pack. And that's due to a variety of factor of factor. Now obviously the, the government uh, policy on, on you know doing the war on sugar, the obesity strategy, etc. That's got a big part to play. But the narrative is quite negative. Whereas with get health we can turn it into a bit more of a positive message. And I do think that there is a big opportunity in the UK to, to champion that fiber and replicate what's been seen in the world. Um, so yeah, really simplifying, really focusing on consumer awareness rather than the claim because they do know about it already. So we have to find more um, creative messaging and it's down to who has got the most simple marketing. These are the ones who are going to sell above and beyond others when actually products are very similar. If we focus on fibre, how do we make higher fibre choices easier to find, more accessible, same price as everything else, and really simple to make that swap for customers? So really just encouraging those, you know, going from white to whole meal choices easier when you're standing at the fixture. And actually, I think that's the way through it is you're actually suggesting here's some very simple alternatives. But also, what can we do that adds fiber into products that are accessible that are people's everyday choices that doesn't affect quality or taste still delivers almost the sort of stealth addition of, of fiber into diets I, I think is is a huge opportunity but it's what sounds really simple as a as a thing to do is really hard and actually what I'm very conscious of is to get the real benefits. This is a this is behavior this is something that you really have to do every day it's not it's not the drink you have the day after you've had a full blowout think I need to rebalance. I think it really has to be a joint industry yeah. effort and Sophie on that you know obviously you're coming from the clinical arm what do you think industry can do to help us and and, and help in that way for people to create those behavioral habits? Yeah yeah I think it's difficult for sure I mean I, I do still think that the 
um, if there was more of a push towards increasing fiber in products as a whole, those products that people, so this is re reformulation piece again, you know, the things that we can do every day, the things that we know are accessible to people, the things that we know people particularly, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about making this accessible and easy for people who don't have a lot of choice in terms of the foods that they can afford to buy. Right. So if we can even just add a bit of extra fiber to bread habitually, <laughs> or add a bit of extra fiber to crisps or biscuits, for example, things that we know that people from lower socioeconomic groups are buying because they have to have happy kids with full tummies and they, that's the only thing they'll eat. These kinds of people who are really struggling and that's only unfortunately gonna be more and more of the population. If we can nudge some of those foods just to being healthier, even through stealth, as we say, I think that's going to make a big difference. And ultimately we know that and still a big majority of people, big proportion of people are not meeting their five a day but if they could be then that would make a big difference to people if we can do anything that makes that easier and I think big chains like Tesco sometimes there's some great innovations around kind of making some every diff a different fruit and vegetable super cheap every week right so it's like this week this is only a pound or this is only 50p so that people can improve their variety experiment a bit more with different fruits and vegetables bundling things up into packs so people have got a few different vegetables or fruits that they can have those sorts of things can make a big difference and can help those who are really struggling to actually improve the variety and, and experiment with different fruits and vegetables. Um, is it potential a solution, Charles, to start to segment the audiences and the people that we're going after, you know, mums trying to look after their baby's guts, um, you know, people that want kombucha and sauerkraut and all the other stuff, and then people that are just trying to swap in some veg? I mean, we do see in other parts of health brands targeting particular need states or life stages. And I think it's perhaps having a combination of some of the things that we've talk, talked about, an overarching unified message that perhaps um, sees uh, industry coming together, collaborating, unifying language, perhaps even uh, and, and terminology, maybe even iconography, so that we can get the fibre piece uh, right, if that's what, as an industry, we feel like we should be doing. Uh, and that can very logically tie in with things like a five a day. And I don't know, Karen, what you think, but that feels um, uh, you know, a communication strand that, um, that could work within retail. But then having specific conversations with specific audiences, whether that's, um, you know, weaning um, babies and toddlers or whether that's other different life stages and then having dis discrete conversations um, with those particular audiences at those at those times. So you've got something that's overarching, unified, that brings the industry together, common language, and then having discrete conversations against particular need states or life stages feels like it could um it could work i think as well what we found when we you started dipping our toe out of just education into product was that it was the education along the chain so i remember speaking to a buyer at a well-known supermarket and they said to me what's fiber um which sort of catapulted our workplace wellness of us going into lots of different places you know everywhere from visa and ego but also into retailers and and educating the store staff and um, but also someone that's maybe in it or like and then that's how you sort of get that message and education spread and also just from a you know a mass market point of view they'll go home and tell their partner and hopefully other kids and and that is hopefully that grassroots work that that we've been trying to do at the gut stuff if everyone can get on board and do that as well that that could and should help a bit, a, bit, a bit like a sort of I mean, gut, gut health is it's kind of every, it's everyone's responsibility it's everyone's job you know we see a bit of that in um starting to emerge in the world of sustainability and esg you know a whole you know platforms that are um that are beginning to emerge to educate workforces so workforces can influence products ranges but also influence up within their organization to make sustainability esg um you know give it more of a voice and start within the industry and perhaps there's something transferable there from this perspective as well i think we also need to um, acknowledge that the government needs to get on board with this in the same way that they have done with heart health and uh, reducing sugar for example i think there's so many great benefits to in including fiber and of course the world's on fire so nobody is particularly engaged in these things right now but i think if they're a really strong public health strategy mm -hmm. around the increased fiber in people's diets and the benefits that that could have 
could have a major impact on people's understanding and like I can imagine some really great tv adverts that would really help people just to understand a little bit more about this and why it's important and the fact that you will get heart benefits and potentially even diabetes control benefits from increasing fiber alone like why are we not there yet and, and I sort of know why because everything's awful but you know there is such great potential there just for those messages and that could feed really nicely into people understanding a bit more about fiber and gut health and everything else some of the, the things we can do can be quite simple. So at the moment, if I kind of go back to the, the subject matter um, on the regulation point of view, we don't have to have the level of fiber in the product. It's not mandatory to labor. Yeah. So a simple change to make this mandatory in fact would force that level to be displayed. But then if it was also the whole industry would just display it on the front of back and just said contains fiber, gave the level, that would already set, be such a big change. Yes, there will need to be some reformulation at some stage, but I, I, I suspect a lot of products also already have fiber, but just don't shout about it. Yeah. Um, so that could be a very simple first step that, that would really improve the understanding and the awareness of fiber in products. Um, I'm just picking up on uh, something that Charles mentioned earlier about um, you know, creating consistent messages. So if I think about the, the impact and strength of one or two of your five a day is a kind of labeling and a message, I think what's interesting is what could the fiber equivalent be of that mm. that would make it really easy for to make those choices and you know we're all talking about this broadly from a position of expertise and knowledge and interest but what really cuts through at the shelf edge uh, and at the decision point I think the, the one of your five a day or the five a day message is an interesting example of of how you turn a complex conversation into a quite straightforward decision. So there was some messaging around um or there is some messaging floating around around three whole grains a day I think three portions of whole grains a day you're all nodding so I think I've got that right it could be two um but I we are then also fighting a tide of influencers and other people saying that we shouldn't be eating carbs at all and the keto crowd and everything else so we, it's hard it's hard in this category and I think that's one of the barriers that people have is oh, I shouldn't be eating why is the government telling me to eat more whole grains when everyone else that every all the other noise that I hear is saying that I shouldn't be eating carbohydrates at all so it is complicated but I do think some really clear messaging around that kind of stuff would make a massive difference um and some goal-based things you know 30 grams of fiber is intangible for most people as Elisa and Alana have pointed out so how do we make that accessible and understandable to people um and maybe it's something as simple as you know three high fiber foods a day or something that could just help people to try and meet it in a way that feels accessible but it's not it's not straightforward and it's not easy and particularly when there is such disagreement across the industry about what's important and what's not important and the regulations are a mess and everything else it's it's, it's difficult I think as well like Karen you've touched a lot about and we are completely on board and agree with the, the behavior type thing you know I think we all think when we think about health which it's about restriction and not about adding stuff in and that even just switch is so difficult to get people to do so they're going what to be healthy it's not about taking stuff out of my diet I've got to put it in and even that like that switch is is really hard for for people to get but in order to create this category and you know really make real proper change we all have to do it together so it'd be great to hear um what you think we should all be doing uh, and when you think the wave might crash <laughs> um, we know from our point of view we actually have a channel four series coming out at the start of next year so hopefully that can be part of the, the surfing <laughs> wave um, a little yeah. cuddle wave like da -da 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 -da. <laughs> or, or the litmus test <laughs> I think yeah and back on, on, on the TV show it's going to really be impactful like we know how media PR all of that has such an impact of consumer's perception I think my one message outside of champion and fiber, which I think we kind of drummed a bit on quite a bit, is um, is simplify. To simplify the message for industry not to go out with those technical, scientific branding, regardless of the category, be it food, be it supplements, just simplify and and, and focus on education. Uh, uh, for me, it would be about meeting consumers where they are and uh, and having some empathy with where they are, make it really understandable. And I, I love the fact that you know, we actually talk about, it was a real kind of moment earlier on when you said actually you you get to experience whether your gut is working every day and actually um, we're going we're gonna to need to talk about that. I think make it real 
for people. Uh, and I think the other one for me is make it delicious. I think food is to be enjoyed. Um, and if you can enjoy something and it's well within the you know, remit of the of the industry and the scope of gut health for it to be absolutely delicious, because that's people love delicious food. I suppose from my perspective, I think I would really echo what Jen and Charles have said there. And I think whilst some of it might seem quite negative, I just think this is an amazing opportunity and the, the wave is just about to break. Like it's going to happen at any moment. And those who are at the forefront of it are going to reap the rewards. The consumer, in my opinion, is ready for this, whether they know it or not. <laughs> and I think once the conversations start happening um, and people have more public awareness of these things, I, I feel really hopeful that people will go, well, I'm interested in immunity and I'm interested in like, I'm interested in my brain function and I'm interested in these things. And all of those are linked to my gut health. Well, let me invest in that a little bit. And I think that we are close to that happening and that understanding being much more, uh, you know, in the, within the general population. But I think the most important thing for the category is, in my heart, is that it remains accessible because uh, it is accessible. It shouldn't be expensive. It shouldn't be this aspirational thing. It's available to everybody and it's it's not a, it doesn't have to be a costly thing, um, especially if we can get the food industry on board to do a bit of reformulation to really support those who are going to have to make those really difficult supermarket decisions every day uh, now and in the future. I agree with sort of all previous conversations and definitely building on, on Sophie's point. I think from a retailer perspective, it is about ensuring always having great alternative, great choices for customers at the shelf that are really easy and simple to understand. So those those choices are, are, are straightforward. And whether that's reformulating existing to add in fruit, veg, fiber, or creating brilliant accessible alternatives, um, it is about making it really simple at point of purchase so that customers can make a straightforward choice. I think from Alana's perspective, it's just to thank Charles for bringing us all together and we should do this every week over a high fibre dinner because I think that's the future, <laughs> um, is everyone kind of getting their heads together and, and working out you know, what the challenges are. Each, you know, we've seen from the last three years that the world will throw lots of curveballs um, and when you're trying to do you know, a job like this, um, you, know, you have to keep pivoting uh, and reacting and I think yeah, industry all chatting together by a Zoom or, or dinner or a glass of wine or otherwise I think is the is the key to, to Absolutely. Can I just ask that at least from the line, can I just you mentioned it just a couple of moments ago about the TV series can when can we can we expect that and can you tell us a little bit about it or what can you yeah, tell I wish us? We knew. <laughs> I wish we knew when it was coming early next year we think it's yeah. coming out it's called Know Your Shit um, and it's a six part one hour um six part hour long episodes um which Sophie's involved in as well uh we've got amazing experts and contributors and it's basically it looks the show looks like a film it doesn't look like a clinical tv show it yeah. looks amazing we hope that we're kind of in the echo chamber in the minute because we're still film filming and everyone's like this is going to be great <laughs> and i really hope it is um but if it does nothing else it will certainly you know we've got um the biggest platform that we possibly could have for gut health um so if this doesn't start the wave machine going um i'm not sure what will well hopefully that will stimulate the wave machine um alana lisa karen jen sophie a huge huge thank you from team tfp and the 2022 summit audience for sharing your extensive expertise and knowledge uh today thank you all for joining us really fascinating and thought-provoking session. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.